Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. And I would like to welcome you all for an insightful session on energy storage integration. I'm Mitara Pereira, your host for the day, and I warmly welcome you to the fourth workshop of the Battery Technology and Charging Infrastructure for Electric Vehicle Workshop series organized by IEEE y 2 Pro. To give a brief overview of this workshop series, this is a comprehensive course that offers both theoretical and practical insights into battery technologies and charging infrastructures of EVs. This series addresses the surging demand for expertise in the EV sector, focusing on battery systems and charging infrastructure. You will be able to explore the evolution, operational principles, and future advancements of EVs, delving into battery technologies and innovations aimed at enhancing efficiency and safety. Today's workshop focuses on energy storage integration, specifically battery storage in renewable energy grids, microgrids and distributed energy resources, and energy management systems for optimized load balancing. Before moving on, we have some important announcements to make. We have already shared these guidelines to be followed during the workshop series. However, I will read the guidelines and make sure that you follow them for a smooth session. A quiz would be administered at the end of the workshop series on the 5th of October, where you would be assessed on the knowledge gain. The IEEE credential certificate will be awarded only if you achieve at least 80% on the above mentioned quiz and attend at least 80% of the sessions. Attendance will be marked at three given instances of the session. Therefore, please be present throughout the session. The recording of the webinar will be uploaded to the Google Classroom. Please rename yourself using the registration number provided in the handbook and your name if you haven't done so already. Today, we are honored to have a distinguished industry expert with us who will guide you through advanced energy storage integration, specifically battery storage in renewable energy grids microgrids and distributed energy resources, and energy management systems for optimized load balancing. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and joining us today. Professor Anura Vijayapala, an accomplished electrical engineer who has graduated with honors from the University of Moratua in 1991. His career includes pivotal roles such as transformer design engineer at Lanka Transformers Limited, and as manager hydropower at Nividu Private Limited, transitioning to academia in 2005, he became a senior lecturer at the University of Moratua, where he currently serves as a professor. His contributions extend beyond academia, leaving, having chaired prominent entities like Ceylon Electricity Board and LTL Holdings Limited, leading initiatives in energy planning, renewable energy, and industrial safety. An esteemed fellow of the East Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, Professor Vijayapala continues to shape the future of electrical engineering in Sri Lanka and beyond. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Anura Vijayapala to deliver the keynote speech on energy storage integration. The spotlight is yours, sir. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope I am audible to you all and uh... Let me share my screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I thank uh, Young Tunish uh, Professionals uh, Network of IEEE for inviting me to talk to you this evening. I hope my voice and voice is clear to you and the screen is uh, visible. Give me some feedback. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Okay. So uh, the topic given is a little bit uh, away from uh, EVs, but it's regarding a uh, uh, 
uh, use of batteries in microgrids and energy storage for renewable energy. But you know, I'm, I myself is a uh, EV user for the last five years. So at the end part of this uh, lecture, I would like to share some of my experience in regard to using uh, uh, electric vehicles in conjunction with the available rooftop uh, uh, schemes and how you can or how we all of us can benefit from that and especially how attractive are the EVs uh, together with the rooftop solar uh, for the benefit of our economic uh, uh, economic capital. Okay, so, but before that, we will go through the, uh, the, the present lecture, which is uh, revolving around the, uh, the microgrid pilot project we did uh, at University of Morotua. So I will have a few uh, slides on microgrids and the general concept on microgrids. And uh, then I will move into our sharing our experience in uh, installation and uh, the the so far about one and a half years, two years now, our usage of the microgrid in Sri Lanka, because I we do none of us will claim to be experts in microgrid technology, because it is uh, an emerging area which has uh, been introduced to the sector uh, quite recently. So so we are all we all are in a learning curve now. Today you will get some introduction. Maybe you are already exposed to it uh, in some you are there already. But we all are in a learning curve. So, and uh, uh, with the green demand for the, uh, you know, green power and the green demand on the whole sector, sustainability and moving away from fossil fuel generation and centralized generation, etc. So, the future we all will be more focused on a prosumer approach that is uh, while consuming to be producing as well, especially using renewable energy and thereby being in. Uh, micro uh, grids or even nano grids that which are even the smaller home like grids and then operating them in a sustainable and a stable and a reliable way and then uh, how they can be win-win uh, solutions or even sometimes uh, even better than the grid uh, in a way that you know you have your own control on these systems so having said that let me go through the presentation i have prepared for this evening uh, so, you know that, uh, uh, so we have been until recently in centralized electricity generation uh, grids, where we generate electricity in central power plants in Sri Lankan context, like uh, Lak Vijay, 900 megawatt, or uh, hydro power plants like uh, Kotmale, Victoria, Samanlava, Lakshapana complex, and so on. They are centralized power plants. So, we produce in them and distribute to load centers and throughout the country for the consumers to have electrical energy. So that is the, 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 the way the electricity was produced and distributed all over the world over the years, last maybe over, uh, say over 150 years. So, uh, but uh, the centralized generation is good in a way because they have, they have the economy of a scale. You can have very large power plant and uh, the management might be easier. But at the same time, they have their drawbacks, like you know, security issues. If a large power plant is having a technical issue or even a security issue, then when that chunk of power plant uh, capacity is lost to the network, then uh, we are short of power probably if we don't have sufficient backups. And uh, then in the last 20 years, maybe, uh, the concept of distributed uh, generation came up. Distributed generation, as you all know, are uh, uh, small scale power plants uh, uh, connected to the distribution voltage levels in Sri Lankan context, maybe 33 kV or 11 kV or 400 uh, volts levels. So they are small in capacity, distributed in nature. For example, best example is rooftop solar power plants, which are spread all over the country on rooftops, maybe in small capacity like 5 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt, uh, 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, depending upon the, the nature of the business and also the nature of the location, etc. and the grid availability, etc. But they are distributed in nature. 
So if one power plant is having a problem, it doesn't make much of an effect because the size is small. And then, you know, that uh, uh, microgrid concept came up with this distributed generation. So when you have a centralized power plants, it is one way power flow from large power plant to, uh, uh, to the load centers. But when you have distributed generation, so in a small network area, maybe even a small low voltage feeder, there can be uh, several rooftop solar power plants, maybe some battery storage, maybe if it's a windy area, a small wind power plant, etc., etc. And then it may be connected to the grid as well for the reliability matters. But it can operate in autonomous manner with the, without the grid as well. So, so that is a microgrid or a nanogrid. If it is very small, we can call it a nanogrid, but concepts are the same. And then they have their own ways of management. And uh, so, and then in meanwhile came with, with the introduction of the all the latest of technologies, there came the ideas of, you know, smart grids. So a smart grid, a microgrid or a centralized grid can be a smart grid. Even a central large power, power grid can be a smart grid. That is, uh, which is, you know, uh, having smart features like uh, say auto, auto, automatic operations and maybe a control center can operate everything in the grid, large grid. In Sri Lankan context also our CB control center can do a lot of things from remotely and also can see each and every grid substation, its operations, every breaker. And if there's a line or something is in trouble immediately, it is visible into the central control system which was not available some time ago. And all these features, including say smart metering equipment, et cetera, have made smart grids. So microgrids by nature, they are smart grids. So although we don't have put the smart microgrids, so we don't put it because microgrids have to be smart in nature. That is, you know, uh, they can be, they can have all the features of modern technology embedded into the control systems. You will see when we dis when we go shortly into the pilot microgrid project at University of Moratua, and you can see most of these features embedded into the operation. And uh, so, 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 unlike olden days, therefore, microgrids are going to be the the futuristic uh, electricity grids. And you know that your home itself can be a microgrid. Uh, and you know that uh, long now all our homes, etc., are uh, AC uh, powered by now. But we, who knows in the future? Because uh, now most of the things, utilizations at homes becomes DC at the end of the day. All of our electrical equipment, smart devices, phone charging and whatnot. Oh, most of the loads are DC in nature at homes, modern modern equipment, except maybe heaters and fridges and all these things, which have motors and rotating equipment like wind blenders and so on. Oh, all the other equipment, uh, say, say electronic equipment are powered by DC. So now if you see AC, you have to convert all the AC into DC for utilization and this smart equipment. And on the other hand also, now as a prosumer, if you produce electricity, et cetera, at home, they become, they are also generated in DC. And then you have an inverter to convert them to AC. So now maybe in the future, the, it will be a good uh, discussion and uh, open thinking, uh, which uh, grid, um, nano grids at home should be better. Could it be a could it be a DC grid better for uh, better for the home? And uh, therefore, you can directly connect your uh, your uh, solar generation and also all the electrical equipment or uh, electronic equipment which are working on DC uh, to uh, the the. The, the microgrid which is operating on DC. So it is uh, it's open thinking and maybe in the future we will have to uh, see which which would be better for different options available 
And meanwhile, the central uh, grid will be operating on AC definitely because long distance transmission is in all. And, and voltage uh, changes are required at these different levels using transformers. But uh, it can be connected to DC homes if required using, uh, say, AC to DC converters or whatever the devices that might be more appropriate. So these are open thinking. So microgrid can be AC or DC. But today we will discuss our microgrid pilot project, which was uh, which is installed at uh, University of Monaco, which is a AC microgrid. If you have any questions or anything, you can uh, put a chat message. So time to time, I can have a look at the chat box. Maybe or you can raise hand or you can uh, speak and maybe just uh, speak and uh, talk to me, uh, which will be making our discussion this evening more interesting if we can have a dialogue. And maybe you can contribute because some of you may have. Uh, so expert knowledge in some of these areas and maybe you can contribute to enrich our discussion this evening. And uh, so so why microgrids are important and why they are thought of as uh, the futuristic? So we can have fuel optimization. We can have, of course, conventional generation connected to the microgrid like a diesel generator, but you can optimize it, minimize the usage of diesel uh, while maximizing the usage of, say, uh, uh, renewable energy and battery storage so that your fuel optimization is there. And also you can use the grid power rather than using a uh, diesel generator. And diesel generator might be the, the last resort in case of you don't have the grid and your battery is dead due to uh, the full uh, discharge and your renewable sources are not working or not available, maybe at night. And so uh, as the last resort, you might use the diesel generator, but otherwise you will not switch on the diesel generator. But in that more University of Morotua, we hardly use the diesel generator. We can manage the grid is normally available. So our options are our own generation using solar PV and then the storage in our batteries and then uh, the grid. And if all these fails only, we need the diesel generator, which is uh, very rare. And then the connectivity, reliability, peak shaving, stability, and other uh, grid bound benefits. You know, uh, we now our Sri Lankan grid is pretty uh, okay by now. I think the reliability is pretty okay, especially in the urban areas. But in rural areas, uh, sometimes there are long outages. But if you have microgrids, uh, then they have better reliability because whenever the grid goes, it can auto auto automatically switch into autonomous mode if they have batteries, battery power, and then uh, maintain the system for some time until the grid comes back, right? And also uh, renewable uh, and clean technology solutions and grid commitments uh, are, are these days the distributed generators are uh, green sources like wind, solar, and so on. And uh, they can be easily integrated into microgrid. So therefore, uh, it's a good time to think about microgrids. And uh, and there are emerging technologies uh, coming uh, bound to the microgrid technologies and making them even more competitive in the coming uh, years. And at Morocco, we are now this uh, now we are now uh, sharing our knowledge with industry uh, parts, industry party, industry uh, the groups like hotels and industries and who are willing to invest in microgrids uh, because they have their own competitive edge. For example, some want to label them as 100% renewable and thereby they don't want to have the grid power. So they want to have solar power, wind power and battery power, whatever the sources available near to them and then uh, keep the grid as much as away and then they can label their products as 100% green uh, energy power, green electricity powered products. So which has a competitive edge in the markets in Europe and so on uh, under the present conditions. And uh, some key features of a microgrid, uh, it's a local, right? Uh, so usually it creates energy for itself or nearby customers. So a microgrid, now in the University of Porto, we produce a lot of electricity using our own solar panels so so it's local and but of course when we are deficit we will use from 
uh, the grid uh, Leco supply. And we, I, we will share some of couple of examples of how we have been uh, utilizing couple of days uh, uh, the grid power uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, solar power generation, the battery. I will show you some uh, uh, some uh, energy supply uh, graphs which shows how we have been managing during the day. And then how to optimize it, how to optimize it depending upon your tariff system, et cetera, which will be interesting uh, depending upon whether you are in time of the tariff, et cetera, then you can use your storages to discharge during the high tariff uh, uh, time slots. And a microwave is intelligent. Uh, so the central brain or the microwave controller is where the intelligence originates. You know, in our system, we have a universal uh, power uh, controller. Uh, so, so you can see that uh, it's controlling the entire microgrid, and which can be programmed, which can be set, and which can be, you know, programs can be changed depending upon your requirement. So it is intelligent. And you know that in the coming years, with the, uh, with the AI and other technologies creeping in, they will get more and more intelligent and maybe even you know autonomous and you know you don't have to interfere very much. Even if there are when there are problems, they will have self-recovering abilities. Uh, so there are many types of microgrids emerging. So off-grid microgrids where you don't have the grid. And then you will have to uh, uh, have your grid sufficiently uh, backed up with batteries, etc., to uh, uh, so supply the the demand uh, throughout the day, or else you will have to have load management systems uh, to control the load so that uh, you can uh, meet the supply and demand so that uh, the grid can be maintained, the grid reliability can be maintained. And they can be community microgrids. I'm sure that some of you may remember in Sri Lanka also, we had uh, uh, village hydro schemes some time back. So they can they were not very intelligent, but they were rather passive, but they were also uh, uh, acting like a community microgrid. They had a small uh, a micro or nano kind of uh, I2 power plant, supply maybe 20, 30 houses, and uh, a grid was formed by a small low voltage network. And then it supplied electricity to households in a very remote village where the grid is not available. And it was maintained by the community. And it was a basic architecture, it had the basic architecture of a micro. So, so village hydro schemes, I have seen a couple of them, probably some of you may have seen them uh, uh, in very remote areas about the grid when the grid was not available. But luckily now the, the our grid has extended to every corner of the country and even the remotest areas. And uh, uh, so that uh, uh, every, so those village hydros uh, rather than abandoned, I would say they have been converted to grid connected hydros and they are selling their product to the uh, grid and have become uh, uh, what I call these IPPs, uh, independent power producers in most of the cases. And then universities like our university and other community uh, services uh, have developed their own microgrids for, you know, for through their research and uh, as the emerging technologies and also nanogrids which are the smaller forms of microgrids, maybe you can consider a home as a nanogrid. And uh, uh, you know that uh, some commercial benefits of microgrids, right? Uh, prosumers or consumers, they can uh, savings on energy costs, enhanced in uh, reliability and resilience. Now, for example, at University of Moratua, uh, when there were power cuts uh, during, uh, you know, that the most severe period of 2022 and so on, uh, in the areas where the microgrid was operating, so most of the time we had power. Most of the time we had power because we had a sufficiently large battery. And so we didn't feel the deficit of electricity, even though there were long power cuts, we could still manage uh, our supplies with our own microgrid. 
so we were lucky in a sense that uh, we didn't feel much of a power cuts uh, for academic work at least in our the areas which are supplied by this microgrid so it is a it is a it's a good experience you know that in the futuristic world if there are wars and other things uh, if a central grid is damaged by a war like what is happening in ukraine to restore it will be very difficult to restore it will be difficult but if you have microgrids so maybe even if it's damaged so it's a matter of you know it's a small scale and you know the technology so maybe you can uh, quickly put put that put it back in operation right because it's own based on your own generation and some batteries and other things even parts are damaged then you can replace them or in some or other at least part of it can be put into service so so in that sense uh, it may be a, a more controllable and reduced carbon footprint to meet sustainability goals because of most of them are involved in uh, green uh, generation like solar wind etc and uh, so the and they can be used for peak shaving if you have batteries enhanced reliability services lower cost for upgrading or investing in grids and uh, some different commercial models for microgrids uh, they can be consumer owned microgrids right so now we have a now at Morato we have a consumer owned micro so we are connected to the grid utility and we sell excess energy so we sell excess energy take a pen. here you can see we are selling energy to the grid when we have excess and uh, we get paid for the exported energy and then uh, we operate the microgrid right and then we uh, cover the the, the capital cost and operate, operating cost uh, using the income we get, right? And so that is a consumer on uh, microgrid. And at the same time, uh, utility can own uh, microgrids, right? For so their own reliability increase, right? So to the normal supply, sell energy and uh, receive payments from the consumers, just like what is happening today. But they, they have their own microgrids and that will increase their reliability and the ancillary services for the grid because and they might get the benefit of renewable energy and also special at special locations also they can have them like whatever now, now they are thinking of having these things in island around sri lanka like delft and so on so some of them will be connected to the grid or some may be not connected to the grid so they all are microgrids here now I come to the 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 my pilot microgrid pilot project at University of Morocco. So this was uh, funded by ADB, one of the grants uh, together with uh, uh, attached to some of their fundings to the Sri Lankan uh, power sector, and it was implemented through Lanka Electricity Company Leco. So they were the implementing agency, and University of Morocco is the location where it was implemented in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And they are, we are housed in what we call this uh, this building, Sumanadasa building. This is the Sumanadasa building. And this aerial photo, you can see, I'll go through them later on. So you can, this is one of the oldest buildings, maybe built in 1970s. And uh, so I'm also, uh, my office is here and our department is in the uh, first floor and the second floor of this building. And then, uh, so you can see the, the large number of, uh, rooftop solar panels that we have installed on it not only in this building because this roof was not uh, sufficient and also some part we could use due to certain reasons and then we we use some adjoining buildings like this you can see uh, where we have installed uh, solar pv uh, to get the, the desired generation so this is uh, an overview you can see this is university of morocco premises here yeah, you can see our about 50 acres, I guess. And this is the 255 road, you can see here. And uh, this is our playground here. And this is the Sumanadasa building, where the some main solar panels are installed. And then this part, this building also contains some panels. And so supply comes from 
let go from a root like this. And so it's a grid connected microgrid. Yeah, we will go through the go through the details later, right? And uh, here are some more details you can see. Uh, so we have some other building where the microgrid is installed, and then the two canteen buildings and the new administration building all are connected to this microgrid. Right? The capacities, etc., we will uh, show in a short while. We will see. And here you can see that this is where the Leco transformer is connected. Leco lines come here. And at this location, we have uh, battery storage in a container. And then our diesel generator also here to so this location. And so uh, all the supplies are here. Uh, grid supply is coming here. Diesel generator is here. And also the battery uh, container is here. So all the supplies are uh, somewhere here, right? And then the loads and other things here. And the generation, uh, solar generation in these two buildings, so one of building and two canteen buildings and so on. I will go through the specific uh, information about each unit and some photos of them uh, throughout the, uh, while we discuss in the uh, further details. So here's the scope of the project you can see. So depending upon the available buildings and other things, we have uh, uh, we have uh, demarcated the loads, etc. The amounts we will see later. So in this, this is the main. Let me see where is my pen? Okay, here it is. So this is the main area, main building. Uh, so you can see we have some of the other building loads and the generate solar generation, and the new canteen buildings we have the loads and the solar. New administration building we have solar and the loads again, and then. Uh, we have the diesel generator and the battery banks at the corner I showed you, and then it's connected to the grid here. That get grid here. Uh, this is a point of coupling here with the grid, right? All are connected to uh, this uh, low voltage uh, network, right? Low voltage network is the microgrid that is at 400 volt three phase network. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to raise hands. So I have just, uh, yeah, I don't see any chat messages except the, uh, yeah, I don't see any message, but you can type time to time. I will have a look at it or unless you raise your hand, then show me. Okay. Okay, this uh, shows the details of the uh, the the microgrid, right? Micro. So let us go through it. I think I have them separate later, but in general, you can see it's in uh, several sections here. So this is the this is where the the the, the supplies come in, right? You can see here we have the grid grid power. Here's the grid transformer, and then we have the diesel generator, and then we have the battery storage, which I showed you that they are located here. So all of them are located here. So they are part of this microgrid. So they're, they're, most of the sources are here. So they are connected uh, through uh, their transformers in case of grid because we are getting 11 kV, and then uh, you know, diesel generator is directly connected because it is generating at uh, 400 volt three phase. And then the battery is connected to the inverter, to the inverter uh, and the transformer in connected to the inverter, to the grid. So all are generating at 400 volt three phase and connected to the, the bus here, right? And then which is extended to the uh, loads as well as to the uh, generation in uh, the three buildings that we talked about. So you can see these are the PV systems. I don't know why this line is coming. I'm sorry, but I just want to highlight here PV systems. You can see. So uh, this is uh, 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 in the new administration building, the the uh, PV panels, and this is canteen one and two. 
and this is the main one, Sumandas building, right? Sumandas building. So it has 200 watts, 200, sorry, kilowatts. Sumandas building has 200 kilowatts. Uh, canteens buildings have 50 kilowatts. And new administration building has 100 kilowatts of uh, solar rooftop. So it is all together 350 kilowatts of uh, solar power uh, generation in all the buildings. So they are our main uh, uh, renewable energy sources connected to this microgrid. So all are connected to uh, the, the inverters shown here. I should go through them in a little bit more details later. Right, you can see, so they are the inverters and uh, inverting the DC to three phase 400 volts. Then it is connected to the uh, common bus bar here, that common bus bar here. And to the loads, so in the building loads are connected to the, the individual bus bus, for example, here. So one of the building loads are connected here. Right to the bus bar where the generation is connected and also the grid is grid and other battery are connected. So similarly, other buildings have their own loads. So the loads are also fed by that. We will go through them in a little bit more detail later. So this is a layout of our rooftop on uh, Sumanadas building from another angle you can see. So here we can see all, uh, uh, most of the, the solar installations here from this photo. This is Sumanadas building and then the other canteen box, etc. right? So this is the uh, the battery container, right, battery container here. This is battery container. And here is the diesel generator, a diesel generator uh, connected here. And then this is the transformer uh, coming from 630 kVA transformer, uh, bringing, this is the, the LECO, 11 kV lines coming in. So we have all sources located here. And here some photos of the inside of the battery container. These are the batteries. You can see battery racks, right? And here is the diesel generator, the control panels, etc. And uh, uh, and all these are uh, uh, connected or well, controlled by this universal power platform uh, supplied by uh, a company called D Hybrid, and uh, so because this is a this this entire project is funded by ADP, so they had to do it as a procurement. So they couldn't, uh, even though we would have liked to have research and uh, put some of our thoughts, uh, some of our knowledge into this microgrid, but it was purchased by the ADB through LECO and supplied to us. So we accepted it. And then now we are doing our own research using the microgrid. And connected to the microgrid, we have a, uh, again a nanogrid, we can call it for the laboratory expense, which is not connected to the microgrid, which is operating separately for the students to research with. So this is uh, the, the panel at the the, the microgrid lab, uh, where you can see most of the operations, CARDAS uh, operations, and you can monitor the all the, the the equipment which are distributed in the university. But everything is uh, can be monitored and observed here, and then we can notice any abnormalities and take appropriate action where something something goes wrong. Here's the here's a, a slide showing some system uh, overview. This uh, D hybrid is the company uh, providing the control, all the control systems. So, so they provided the control equipment, right? And now they are not in, they supplied and went off and now we are operating it uh, on our own. There are some issues sometimes. So they help us to overcome them. But other than that, uh, entire operation is now with us, uh, with our technical team at university. But you know, it's a little bit challenging because university is having a bit depleted the staff, and also uh, uh, we cannot recruit people for, especially for maintaining the microgrid, etc. So we have to use existing people, and it's uh, uh, you can't uh, hand over the operation today from one person to another. 
because somebody must be their knowledgeable person throughout. So we are struggling to maintain it, but it's, it's, they are still doing it. So this is uh, uh, the all the sources that we looked at. Uh, Leco uh, transformer, 630 kVA, 400 volt supply, grid, what we call the grid supply. And then we have the 630 kVA diesel generator. In, we, are, we, have, we will use it as a last resort, but we are hardly using it because the diesel is expensive. It's always, it is cheaper to use uh, grid power or uh, solar PV generated power uh, than the diesel power because the diesel, uh, these small diesel generators cannot produce uh, even four units from one liter of diesel. Maybe it's slightly less than four units that comes from a, a small diesel generator. Therefore, even if the diesel price is 300 rupees per liter, you can see still it costs uh, over 75 rupees. Even if you produce four units, it's 75 rupees per kilowatt hour for diesel alone. Forget about the spare parts and our, the, the lubrication services and all these things. Again, the capital cost, even for you, for you forget all these things, fuel alone will cost 75 rupees a, a unit. Are, but the grid will not be that expensive, neither the solar uh, generated the electricity. Therefore, the diesel generator is there only to make sure in the worst and worst case that we have some source to depend upon uh, the supplies to make sure our reliability is almost 100%. And we uh, use this uh, solar PV uh, system. This, these are the specifications for panels we use. Uh, so uh, in the range of 400 watts uh, per panel, and you can see some information about the panel voltages, open circuit voltage, short circuit current, etc. And efficiency is almost 20% as they claim under the standard uh, uh, test conditions. Uh, but you know that uh, uh, you know that uh, although we call the efficiencies of this nature, but there are many things to reduce the output, like the dust and dirt and cleaning. Uh, so whenever you have rooftop systems, if you have, you may have your own experience, it is not easy to clean them because they are not uh, you know accessible easily, and also it is uh, not uh, very you know safe for anybody to go and clean them. You must have skilled people who knowledge is not the subject. Uh, to go up, up on a rooftop and to clean them. Therefore, most of the uh, rooftop solar PV panels installed in Sri Lanka and maybe in elsewhere also, including my own one in my roof, where I am sitting now, are not properly cleaned. Therefore, there are a lot of uh, reductions in generation, unfortunately. But if you have a centralized power plant, like in a ground-mounted power plant, uh, they are on ground level and easily accessible. Therefore, the washing can be done easily. And therefore, uh, you know, that uh, module, uh, not the efficiency really, module output wise, they will perform better uh, due to number of reasons. And also, you know, that uh, if you look at uh, any of these roofs, uh, these roofs were not made for rooftop soil. Because now Sri Lanka being uh, just above the equator, right? And uh, so, the, if you theoretically, sun goes south to us. So, uh, although we rotate, we, we can relatively call it sun goes from east to west. So, it goes south of us. So, if a roof is facing due south, so that is the best for solar installation. But uh, which is uh, not the case for rooftop because our roofs are not built in such an organized manner because they are not when the room now Sumanda's building was built in 1970s. I'm sure that the architects of that era never thought that the, this building will be having a solar rooftop system in coming years. And this is a good place. And I think I should emphasize here uh, to the audience, I think there are about 40 people, 44 people. That's good. And you know that uh, you must take this message. That is, you know. If you or your friends or anybody is building a house, right, building a house, tell the architect or designer that someday this roof will have a rooftop system. So make sure 
that you design the roof so that uh, maybe part of it or full uh, roof is facing south, due south. So that whenever you want to stay, uh, uh, construct a rooftop solar PV system, you will have better plant factor. You will have a better plant factor. You know that uh, because ground mounted power plants, they can, uh, you know, that uh, slant them to whatever the angle of the, you know, facing the, the best way to, so that the solar irradiation can fall perpendicular to it. Maybe in Sri Lankan context, about six to eight degrees, somewhere around that slanted towards sun to south. So that uh, uh, you get the best benefit. Of course, they can have tracking as well in ground mounted power plant. Even if you don't have tracking, you can, you know, that uh, line them so that they will be best facing the sun. But roofs are not. The consequence is uh, ground mounted power plants, which are having, uh, say, without having even tracking or whatever, will have about 18% plant, 17, 18% plant factor in most of our sites in Sri Lanka, in Vaumia, Ambantut, and so on. Right? But if you consider rooftop, rooftop solar power, solar systems, they are made the plant factor may be about 12%, around 12 to 14%. So about 5, 4%, 5% loss of energy is there because the roofs are not in the best face in the sun. Right? There have been attempts to maybe to make them, you know, with the structures to make them better facing, but never in the best way. So you can see even in this building, you can see now we can when the sun is coming in this direction, these panels will have the better yield, whereas these panels not. And when the, in the evening, when they go, maybe these panels will have better yield. And not this panel. So you can see. So take the message. Tell your friends. Tell your whoever you have the influence. When they you know see when they are building a house, ask them. Please make sure that your face your roof is facing south, at least portion of it. So that one day, whoever wants to install a solar PV system, will get the, the best deal. So they can increase their plant factor to about fifteen percent, sixteen percent, right? Uh, by having proper, properly uh, south-facing uh, roofs. Okay. So these are the battery packs. <clears throat> Here are the the like this. Am I clear to you, or give me some feedback? It's my Voice and other things are clear, sides are clear. Yes, sir, you are clear. Okay, good. So, uh, so these are the specification of the, the, the PV uh, panels we have. Here are the PV uh, inverters. Uh, that we have installed in each building. I think I showed you here, you can see. So, so there are many inverters here, you can see. So these are inverters, right? And you can see every building has several inverters where the solar uh, panels are installed. Right? And also there is an inverter here where the uh, batteries are connected to the grid. Forgive, forgive me for this line which is coming. I don't know why. Maybe the why the nature of this uh, writing pen. So, so here are some typical uh, specifications of uh, the inverters that we have installed, right? At different locations, their capacities may differ from location to location depending upon the the solar PV capacity installed in. Uh, different uh, 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 roofs. Okay. You can see one good thing is uh, so their efficiencies are pretty in high range. Are pretty in the high range, so that's a good thing. So this is the uh, what you call this universal power platform, right, and the main controller. So, which is controlling all the activities in the uh, microgrid. 
they are controlling the synchronization of uh, uh, the batteries to the system. Or sync now I will go through the the various modes of operation. For example, uh, uh, you know that uh, if the grid fails, if the grid fails, the batteries will automatically take over the operations. And also now we are now sometimes the battery might not have enough enough uh, power. Uh, because it may have already uh, discharged some of its energy. So, you know that therefore we have uh, modernized our grid by installing certain uh, features of, you know, the demand control. For example, we have in such a cases, automatic means of knocking off some of our air conditioners automatically. So we have installed uh, switching devices at uh, uh, some of the air conditioners in Somanadasa building. So that uh, ACs can be knocked off if we don't have sufficient capacity in the battery. Uh, we are battery together with the, uh, if the it, it's a daytime, there might be uh, uh, generation, uh, solar PV generation. We don't have any so wind generation because we are not in a windy area. So it's only solar. So uh, during the daytime, it might be battery plus the solar generation. But if the grid failure is at nighttime, it is solely uh, by the batteries, but night load is pretty low, as we will see shortly, because night we have only the building air conditioners and only minimum, and lighting also maybe not in all the buildings, maybe on the outdoors only, so that uh, nighttime load will be not that much un 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 other than the evening peak probably, but our daytime usage is the maximum because most of our air conditioners in the buildings and the labs will be uh, switched on. And uh, so the how the master controller is a master controller is connected to various uh, platforms that we are uh, we want to control. So it is controlling the diesel generator, and uh, you know that the battery you can see the battery size. Our battery is four hundred kilowatt hour battery. So the four hundred kilowatt hour battery is a pretty big battery. Remember. Uh, so if I just for your uh, understanding, I think you have gone through some electric vehicle. Uh, information charging infrastructure and so on in the previous webinars on the same subject and uh, you know that uh, uh, if you consider the first generation leaf uh, uh, cars nissan leaf cars one i have one of them they had a battery of 24 kilowatt hour and which in the second generation and, and it was in the first generation itself it was made 30 kilowatt hour and in the second generation the batteries were a little larger uh, that they, they became 40 kilowatt hour and the latest was 62 kilowatt. Typically from a kilowatt tower, uh, you can travel about five, six kilometers, right? So you can see, so if you have a 30 kilowatt tower battery, you can run about say on average, about 180 to 100 kilo, kilometers, but it also depends upon uh, the terrain you are driving, whether it's uphill or downhill, and, and so on. So it is it depends upon many other factors, but in general, about five to six kilometers per kilowatt hour. So it's a 30 kilowatt hour battery, largest in Nissan Leaf for 60 kilowatt hour. And you can see, but this is a 400 kilowatt hour battery. So it's a pretty big. And also, if you have, uh, if you don't have electric car experience, uh, if you are using your own car, we call it uh, our bed, our 12 volt batteries are empty hours. I think we have 45 mp hour, 90 mp hour, and so on. You know that uh, maybe about 100 mp hour is equal to one kilowatt hour, roughly. I'm saying, right? For 90 to 100 kilowatt hour, 100 volt mp battery, we'll have a storage about what one kilowatt hour. That you can easily get it. Uh, 45, say 100 uh, volt mp into 12 volts. Or 90 volt, 90 volt ampere into 12 volt, uh, you will get uh, uh, something like say uh, one kilowatt hour, right? One kilowatt hour. So, uh, so 100 ampere hour. So you can see 100 amperes into 12 volts, or 90 ampere hour amperes into uh, 12 volts. So 19 to 12, it's about uh, thousand some thousand eighty or something and then you divide by thousand it is 1.08 kilowatt hours you can convert it to 
a volt uh, volt into MPS as watts and make it kilo by divided by thousand so much. So maybe 90 MPA hour battery is almost one kilowatt hour. So therefore this is like, so you can see uh, 90 MPA hour battery sign, uh, sizable vehicles, right? Like the like large uh, SUVs and so on. Small cars will have 45 MPA hour or 60 MPA hour battery small. That is half a kilowatt hour battery. I'm just telling you to get a grasp of, you know, uh, the size. So, so this is like then 400 90 MPA hour batteries, right? You can see the size. But luckily, these are not uh, lead acid batteries. They are lithium ion batteries. So they are physically small and they are in one container as we saw here, here earlier. So, so this is the battery part. So this is not the size of, uh, uh, say, 400 uh, uh, 90 MPA of uh, lead acid battery. So this is quite small because lithium ion batteries, they have higher, uh, you know, that volumetric as well as gavimetric energy densities, right, compared to lead acid batteries. So then we have the loads and the solar generation, right? So in different buildings, right? So loads and the solar, loads and the solar. So this is the Somandas building, 200 kilowatt solar and 100 kilowatt in the administration building and 50 kilowatt in the canteen buildings. And they have their own loads. So all these are controlled by this uh, universal power platform or the master controller and also the grid operation. So it will this it can be programmed which way it should run. Right, which way it goes in. Sometimes we'll be charging the battery using the grid. Sometimes we'll be charging the battery only with the solar excess solar generation. And we will be selling the excess after charging the battery. We extra energy we free generate during the data and we'll be selling to the grid. Etc. All these things are priority, etc. Uh, decided by the uh, of course we have to program it, then the master controller will uh, decide which way to operate. Here are the, the inputs to the master controller or the universal power platform, the main control. So we have the PV interface, battery system. Uh, for example, in battery, we give the voltage, current, SOC, the state of charge, and the temperature, etc. And the battery inverter, diesel generator, direct control, uh, load control, uh, power meters, energy meters. Uh, then we have a small meteor station. Yeah, it's uh, looking at the temperature and uh, rainfall, uh, wind speed, etc. And in the various breakers, which are connecting all these devices to the status of the breakers, whether they are open or closed or tripped or whatever, the information will come to the main controller. And the main controller can, of course, close some of these things. And so it will give in, uh, uh, the input outputs to uh, various PV interfaces, battery system, battery inverter, diesel generator, direct load control, breakers, and to this, and it will also generate this a SCADA function. And then the web portal where the data will be stored, right? All the data in the uh, system will be stored for uh, our analysis and usage. And, uh, you know, the, the grid will operate in different modes, right? on grid and off grid and uh, in the on grid uh, utility grid will be the master and in the the voltage and the frequency group mode and uh, so the battery inverter in the on grid condition will be uh, working on a set point of uh, active power and the set point of uh, q and the power power factor and the pv inverters will be operating on a set point of uh, of power set power and the Q and the power, uh, power factor. And off-grid mode, we can have the diesel generator if desired, but uh, in the worst case. Otherwise, uh, PV inverters during the daytime, if the uh, uh, solar generation is there, so they will generate depending upon the resource availability. And then the battery will be the main uh, performer during the off-grid conditions. And so we can, we can program how the battery can be uh, discharge uh, and charge during the day depending upon our requirement. We will see some of our typical 
sample graphs of uh, uh, how we have been using this uh, function. Here are some uh, SCADA screens, uh, which are available in the screen in the microgrid lab. Here is uh, uh, the, the, some information we can get from the SCADA. You can see, I'll go through the, the colors and other things later in the next slides. So you can see all these things can be uh, looked at many days backward, how it has been in operation. How much uh, is the uh, energy used for battery charging and battery discharging? And also what has been the general demand of the uh, on the power grid and how much we have imported or how much is the grid supply and uh, uh, all the information, right? So here is a case uh, where we have we are uh, we are operating it on grid uh, with PV and uh, battery system. So you can see these red mark breakers are closed, right? So the diesel generator is not in use. That is why it is not marked red, right? And uh, so all the load breakers, load uh, breakers are on. All the solar breakers are on because they are supplying. Uh, after the inverters to the grid and they are in generation mode, right? In generation mode. So here is, uh, here is how the generation for a typical day. Uh, you can see from, uh, it has from zero hours to about uh, say 24 hours, here up to here, right? You can see. So during the daytime, you can see the solar PV generation peaky. Now I told you that we have, uh, uh, at, uh, 350 uh, kilowatts of uh, uh, solar capacity, but on this day it has peaked to about 200, I would say 260, 70 kilowatt peak, depending upon the solar insulation uh, available on that day, right? So you can see, so it has started, up, uh, uh, you can see uh, almost at 6 a.m. When the lights started to come, it has started generation. And it has gone almost until evening on this day. Right? So some generation has been there, 10, 15, 20 kilowatts have been there. So it's a pretty stable day, maybe uh, clear skies during that day. But there could have been micro changes here, which are not visible in this scale. So therefore, you can see the main sub. And then you can see this one is the uh, load curve, right? So load curve, right? Forget about this uh, line, you can see, which is coming when I press the mouse to draw anything. There's an additional line coming up. I don't know why. I'm sorry. So, and then you can see, uh, uh, so the grid power uh, is the one that is uh, uh, shown here. You can see in the blue color, right? The power supplied by the grid. And then you can see uh, load T, so for example, here, right? Here you can see uh, load is little larger than the grid power because the battery has, you can see the green is battery. Green is battery, right? Green is battery, battery has been discharged. So now it has lost almost, almost energy. And so in the morning, by the morning, battery is fully discharged. And here I have inserted here the state of charge of the battery. You can see early morning hours, right? So battery has been, we have, we have set it to not to discharge beyond 20%. So it will stop discharging after reaching the 20% SOC. Right here you can see, so it is almost delivering nothing now here by here. So the grid power, blue color, is almost equal to load here, right? And then uh, you can see that uh, uh, in the morning, you can see that uh, as soon as the solar generation is started, the battery is here, right? Battery is being charged, right? Battery is in charge. So battery reach 100% SOC by maybe 11 uh, AM or so on this particular day. Right, so it remains there, battery charge, battery fully charged, right, battery fully charged. And then uh, uh, you can see 
during the daytime again you can see uh, so so the the solar generation is more than the than the grid demand the battery is now fully charged initially the grid uh, the, the fully full generation of solar was used for battery charging but after the battery reach fully fully charged after 11 a.m., we started to sell energy. This is selling energy. So this is negative uh, grid. That means we are selling this much of energy to the grid, right to the grid. And then as the solar power goes down in the evening, and also the loads are, you can see the buildings are closed and the labs are closed by after 6 p 4 p.m. and so on. Our loads are also going down, right? And then we start, you can see, discharging batteries, right? Discharging the battery together with the grid we manage. Now, here you can see if you take a point like this, you can see uh, the load is this much, load is this much, and it is made by the grid power plus the battery power plus the battery. So battery green is the battery is discharging now. And the way that it is discharging, you can decide. Right. So here it comes the important thing for optimization. Now if I just escape a little and take this, you know that if I take the CBs uh, uh, this is the CB tariff that we use, right? You can see the this is a, the present tariff we have after July 2024. So you can see if you take, for example, uh, 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 now government rate applicable. You can see uh, government rate applicable to universities, etc. Here you can see. So our our evening uh, uh, peak period that is 6:30 p.m. to 10:30 p.m. Uh, price is uh, 46 rupees per unit, right? So you can see during that time, if we can pump more of our battery into the system, our bill will be low, lower. So depending upon, for example, general purpose, 45 rupees, right? So you can, you can decide the way you discharge if you are in time of data, right? And thereby you can minimize your bill. Right. You can minimize your bill. So we are in the process of optimizing our, but because we don't fully discharge, somebody might ask then, why don't you, uh, here, yeah, uh, why don't you discharge entire amount, entire amount during the peak hours, 18.30 to this hour and so on. But because we want to keep some battery available, because if the grid fails, we have nothing. Therefore, we will not, uh, provide supply the entire battery uh, capacity uh, only during peak time but we will maintain to the entire during night period some battery capacity is available so that at least emergency lights and other things can be available in case of a grid failure but of course you can decide you can even discharge the entire thing during 6 30 pm to 10 30 pm and then you can depend upon your diesel generator in case of a worst case scenario so these are the optimization techniques that you can uh, switch into. Uh, we see have a microgrid and the, uh, the micro uh, the the controller controller can look after this, right? So depending upon your tariff, uh, you can decide which way. Even deciding for a uh, microgrid, you must look at these facts. What are the applicable tariffs, and what are the future tariffs could be? And then, because a microgrid has a lifetime of 20, 30 years, therefore you must take in the long run, right? In the long run, right? So, so now we can see now this uh, DC fast charging, etc. Right? They are pretty expensive electricity. They charge a lot, right? Uh, CB, you can see. So now, uh, now at the university, of, our Department of Electrical Engineering, University of Monaco, and one Indian university. National uh, Institution of Technology, Raukela, India. We are doing a doing a joint research uh, through there is a uh, Indian government research fund for this. So we are doing a joint research 
where we want to make a nano grid kind of a thing, where which has solar and in wind areas wind and a battery, right? This system is connected to a uh, fast charger, electricity fast charger. So if the grid is available, grid can also be connected, but, uh, but your grid will increase the reliability of the system. But even without that, what we plan is for a given amount of expected charging kilowatts, right? Uh, what should be the best combination of solar PV, wind and uh, the battery capacity for the charging system? Of course, we can use software like Homa for the optimization. Uh, but we want to go beyond that and see what how best it can be used for uh, for the for 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 an electric charging station to be powered by solar because solar generation is pretty cheap compared to these numbers you can see 110 and so on so so if you can generate electricity as 25 27 rupees uh, then you know that uh, you can charge charging uh, price could be uh, maybe 50 rupees uh, charging worth. Of course, allocating for the capital investment, capex for the, the charging equipment and the operational costs, etc. Uh, you know that uh, so that that that's a research currently we are doing. Okay, going back to our discussion. So you can see, now you can uh, decide. So here's a off-grid case. Here's a off-grid case where you know that uh, uh, a diesel generator is can be connected or with, even without it, we can operate. So this will be the way the energy is flowing. So the battery will be providing energy. If the solar is also available, solar will also be generating energy. So here's a typical day where the, uh, off-grid operation, right? Off-grid operation. And you can see uh, the load power has been pretty big. And it's still the, the solar PV. You can see the solar PV is here. Solar PV is providing up to this. And then the battery is discharging this much, right? And then together managing the load. Together managing the load, right? So of course now we are implementing a system. If you if you cannot manage to knock off some of less important ACs automatically by the controller, so we have automated some of these uh, knocking off devices, uh, kind of a demand response arrangement. So that is still you can manage in an off-grid situation. So some key features of the project, right? It cost one point two million dollars, uh, which came as a grant. Right, and uh, we it was about two years for the implementation because of there are a lot of red tapes in these things in the government institutions, and uh, so we pro we we produce about one hundred sixty five thousand kilowatt hours, and uh, emissions we can avoid about one hundred seventy five thousand tons of uh, carbon dioxide per year. Right, but some challenges in uh, replicating microgrids, uh, high initial investment. Right, enabling the grid services uh, markets, electricity distribution performance standards, uh, subsidized electricity tariff. Because when you have subsidized tariff, uh, it doesn't uh, really give the uh, true value of the microgrid because the microgrid is expensive because it's given the real price, real price and real cost. But if you have large large power systems with government subsidies and so on, subsidies and cost subsidies, fuel subsidies, etc then things vary, right? And in the same place, we have this uh, R&D laboratory. This is not part of the microgrid. This is a separate small system. You can see, you can see some small batteries, four kilowatt, five kilowatt, five kilowatt, and one kilowatt solar panels that which are connected through various small inverters and they are brought to the, uh, uh, to the, the, the microgrid lab. And these are useful laboratory experiments for the students. Various experiments are there. So they can work with these things with the design. And there's a battery also. We have a Nissan Leaf battery now there. 
24 kilowatt hour battery connected there. And we have this uh, uh, RTDS, real-time digital simulator, also connected to the same system. So there's a lot of research students as well as undergraduates are doing experiments as well as research using this R&D laboratory. So it is separate. It is not part of the microgrid. It is especially for research and experimenting for the students. And of course, this can be accessed by the idea was this should be shared with other universities as well. So the time to time they are supposed to come and uh, gain the gain knowledge and other services of this laboratory. So that uh, there I stop my discussion on uh, uh, you know this uh, microgrids and the energy storage and the renewable energy. Let me share some of my experience uh, with with my solar so rooftop solar system and my EV and uh, how I have tried to optimize and to uh, you know cut down my traveling costs and to make the best use of my rooftop solar system rather than selling electricity to uh, CEB uh, at the, the desired the, 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 the given rates. I think you know that. I, I will show you the three schemes available just to recap. So Nissan Leaf is one of the famous EVs and most famous in Sri Lankan conditions. But of course, now the BYD and other things are more famous in the world, like China and so on. But uh, Japanese vehicle, you know, this was built in uh, 2009 for the uh, domestic market, uh, Japanese domestic market. I think in 2011 or so, they released it to the international market. Initially with the 24 kilowatt hour battery, Right, that is the one I also have. And then in 2013, also 24 kilowatt hour battery. And then later they changed in 2016, the same generation one car to 30 kilowatt hour battery. Right. And this is the shape of the car, which is very famous. So I have one of them. And then the second generation was introduced in 2018 with a slightly larger 400 kilowatt hour battery. You can see, but they are, they are calling to 243 kilometers. So roughly about, you can see six kilometers, roughly, right, per kilowatt hour. You also can see 62 kilowatt hour. So they claim it to run about 364. That is roughly about six kilowatt, six kilometers per kilowatt hour. And the charging arrangements are there, quick charging, and the slow charging, etc. And uh, so by 2020, they have sold nearly half a million cars, right? Half a million cars. And Tesla Model 3 also, half a million cars by 2020, some four years back. I don't have the latest information because this slide I prepared in 2022 or something. So, so uh, typical battery capacity, I think I know that I, I'm, I'm sure that you also, you all, uh, uh, you know, that uh, experience on these things, but there are uh, different types of electric vehicles, what we call this hybrid electric vehicles. <laughs> Right, hybrid electric vehicles, and they have a very small battery. I have what you call hybrid cars, about one kilowatt hour battery. Right. Whereas uh, this plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, I'm sure you have seen uh, uh, some uh, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. They have a medium-sized battery, like six to fifteen kilowatt hour. So battery electric vehicles are having this, like Nissan Leaf or Tesla Model Three, and so on. This twenty-four. Up, uh, plus size, 24 was the smallest size those days, but I think there are small cars like Hyundai small cars, maybe slightly less than that. Uh, 24 to 100 kilowatt hour uh, batteries. And I heard that the BYD and other, some manufacturers have made even, even bigger batteries on pilot projects, which can run 1000 kilometer mark, right? 1000 kilometer mark, just to get an idea. And this is the, the, uh, Nissan Leaf battery architecture. So uh, their their modules are like this. If you look at the car, you can, the battery have uh, opened it up. So these are the modules. You can see the modules are stacked under the boot here, and also under the uh, seats here, right? Seat part here in uh, in three areas. So altogether there are forty eight modules. Each module has four cells. So lithium ion cell has inherent voltage of about 3.7 volts. So you can see this is uh, uh, what you call this uh, uh, 
uh, 2P2S, that is two parallel, two series arrangement, right? Two, two in series and two in parallel. We call it 2S, 2P, right? And then you can see this is one module, one module. So, so each module has about half a kilowatt tower, right? Half a kilowatt tower. So 48 modules will have 24 kilowatt tower theoretical capacity, but you can't take all 24 kilowatt tower out. Maybe about 20, 21 kilowatt towers you can take out. So I just want to have a recap to you. But of course, uh, other increased capacities have different uh, module capacities and the number of modules is also uh, different. And if you just uh, uh, switching from uh, uh, EVs to the uh, so rooftop solar, so I want to combine the, 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 the benefits of the two and show you that uh, how I have tried my best to optimize at my home. And you can see now in Sri Lanka, we have three uh, schemes for solar rooftop systems. I'm sure that you are already aware, but I'm just going to show you uh, as a recap. You know, this is the general arrangement. You have the rooftop solar, and then you have the inverter, DC to AC inverter, and then the meters and the fuse box and other things. You connect it to the grid as well as to the loads, right? So, so the general arrangement. And under this general arrangement, you can have net metering, which was introduced in uh, 2009 or so. The first scheme that came in was net metering. And then net accounting and net plus was introduced in 2016. So I'm, I, I like to mention that I was the chairman of CB then. So we had a lot of discussions into the tariff, et cetera, and introducing these two new schemes. And after introduction of these new two schemes, so solar uh, rooftop business started to boom. You know, So by that time, it was less than, say, about 60, 80 megawatts. And now today, about a few, few weeks back, it crossed the 1,000 megawatt mark. So in Sri Lanka now we have rooftop solar, more than 1,000 megawatts. So pretty size, pretty sizable amount. It became because of the advantages of this net accounting and net plus for certain customers. And here's the net metering scheme uh, where I'm in net metering, where I don't have any financial business with CEB. I'm sure some of you know. So whatever I produce, either I consume or I uh, uh, pump into the network. I pump into the network. So there's an import and export meter. And uh, so every month they will say how much excess I have given to CEB or they might say how much how much is the net import by me if I have made a net import during any month. Under the normal tariff, I will pay them. But usually in my case, I don't pay a cent since 2018 for my electricity bills because my generation is more than my consumption. And therefore, I always have something sold to CEB at the end of, at the, end of the month, right? And then, uh, because after so in, after 2018, where my solar roof was installed under net metering arrangement, uh, I have not paid any electricity bill for the house. It was about 8,000, 10,000 range those days. And then the net, net accounting is every month, but here net, in the net metering, so I have given access to CEB. So it is accumulated in CEB's account. So every month I give something extra. So it is getting accumulated and in books it says you have 500, you have 1000, you have 1500 units accumulated with us. I can withdraw it at any time. But no financial transaction between CEB and me other than paying bills if I have consumed extra during any month. Of course, in net metering, uh, that will be set off against the units that we have already uh, supplied to them if excess is available. So in the net accounting, it is not like that. Every month, every month, uh, it will be uh, settled. So if you have given anything extra, this was the first tariff that was given in 2016, 22 rupees per kilowatt hour for the first seven years. 1550 for the next 13 years. That was the contract signed those days, right? And depending upon the prices of the solar plants, inverters, etc., we decided on the cash flow. We prepared the cash flow with sufficient returns and then decided these were sufficient 
in the as per the prices and the dollar exchange rate that prevailed in 2016-17 period. So every month for the excess energy that you have supplied, uh, CEB will pay you uh, for them. Uh, but it is after deducting your consumption. After deducting your consumption. So it is that's why I call it net accounting. But then uh, we, now this was not attractive to very small users because very small users are enjoying you know this uh, government subsidy on the block tariff maybe if they are using only 60 units uh, per month right then your tariff may be 6 rupees per unit right but if you do net accounting now you are using that uh, that that uh, that low tariff Therefore, we introduced this uh, net plus system where if you have a if you have a very small user, 60 units if you consume, you can your bill will be given for that 60 units based on your block tariff available with the subsidi subsidized electricity. And your entire generation from the your solar rooftop can be sold at the given price. So every unit you produce, you sell at 22 rupees during the first seven years. Whereas you enjoy six rupees per unit, up to 60 units, uh, electricity bill is still. So this was introduced for very small consumers so that they can be benefited by both, by the, the, the solar uh, sales as well as by enjoying, still going on enjoying the low tariff for their smaller consumption. So it is not very attractive for probably for the medium and high-end users, illicit users. Now, uh, the, now you can see now earlier it was uh, 22 rupees and 22 rupees, let us say, per kilowatt hour. And then uh, later on, they increased it to 37 rupees. But during a few weeks back, I think they brought it down to these new units, up to 500 kilowatt, 27 rupees per kilowatt hour. And above 500 units solar installations, rooftop solar installations, 23. And for these are the ground mounted power plants, ground mounted, right? Uh, and wind and biomass and so on. And they are supposed to change. So the now present day is 27 rupees for small rooftop solar installations, the per kilowatt hour. Now I'm going to show you some of the work, uh, some economics that I used uh, in my uh, my uh, opinion which is beneficial to me so let us run by one by one line by line so i installed a five kilowatt pv system and it cost me one million rupees and under net metering scheme uh, in 2018 so it is six years old now it's in operation right uh, and i also bought a used nissan leaf for 1.75 million there's those days the cars were cheap in 2020 2020 right so by 2020, by the operation 18, 19, just end of 2020, about three years, I had banked with CEB about 10,000 units of electricity under net metering scheme, right? So, so that was available. I can take it at any time. So I, now, as soon as I, I, I started, I bought this Nissan Leaf car, now my consumption became large because the car needs uh, one kilowatt hour to run six kilometers, right? So if I run 60 kilometers, on that day, I will use 10 kilowatt hours in addition to my own comp consumption. Now, thereby I started to draw my banked energy, right? Uh, so you can see, if I ran my petrol car, which was not a hybrid, the normal internal combustion car, it runs about on average about 12 kilometers a liter. Right. If I take an average uh, fuel cost of about 300 rupees per liter, so my per kilometer cost is 25 rupees per kilometer. If it is doing 12 kilometers only on fuel, right? So, so now since I'm using electric car, I'm saving for every kilometer 25 rupees on fuel, right? 25 rupees on uh, fuel. So for each kilowatt hour, therefore, I can get 25 rupees into six kilometers. Because from each kilowatt hour, I can run six kilometers. So I save 
hundred fifty rupees per every kilowatt hour I use for, for my electric vehicle. You get my point. So whereas I could have sold electricity at twenty seven rupees per kilowatt hour, now by switching to electric car, I save instead of using my petrol car, hundred fifty rupees per kilowatt. So in other words, I can say. I am selling, rather than selling electricity to CEB, I am selling electricity to myself at 150 rupees per kilowatt hour. Right? So now I have used most of this 10,000 10, units. I think something like 600 units are left behind by even by now. Right? So if I use this 10,000 kilowatt hours at 150, I have saved my fuel cost 1.5 million rupees. Right, 1.5 million rupees. Although I paid 1.75 for the car due to the market conditions, now the car is also valued at 4, 4 million rupees now, even though the battery has deteriorated. Right, and also I don't have much maintenance in this car. I don't have fuel servicing, no, no oils, no oil changes. Only every six months or once a year, I take it for a general maintenance, just to you know wash it and clean it and degrease it and so on, little bit the road, tires, etc. But the tire cost and the 12 volt battery cost will be the same as any other car. Right? So, and uh, so I don't have electricity bills also since 2018, which I have estimated to be, I have saved by now about, uh, say, uh, 800,000 rupees. My bill was not any way large. You can see, when you look at these numbers, you can see solar PV plus an electric vehicle is a very good combination. It's a very good combination. So, of course, there are limitations. Like if you have uh, electric vehicles with limited range, then you must have an additional vehicle. So, if there are husband and wife, and you can have one electric vehicle and one normal vehicle, and then your family will be more secure. And you can get the advantage of, uh, you know, having the rooftop solar uh, generation to be used in a more economical way rather than selling at a low price to see. Right, because your own electricity uh, usage for your EV will be almost like 150 even more rupees per kilowatt hour because of your uh, petrol cost or the diesel cost or whatever the fuel cost will be much higher than uh, the whatever the the sales cost of your uh, sales sales uh, price of your uh, electricity to the grid. So therefore. It is more advantageous, so I'm saying, so this may be my concluding slide. And so, so I'm just giving some ideas, you know. So, so, so think in economical economics, right? Think in economics, which is very lacking in Sri Lankan context, because the financial literacy is very low in Sri Lanka, even among engineers, even among engineers. So financial literacy is a must. So whatever we do, we have to look at whether it is really worthwhile an investment, whether we make we think in rupees and cents, so that uh, uh, end of the day, you will be benefited. And after all, when we all are benefited, the country will be benefited and the uh, country will not get get bankrupt like what happened in Sri Lanka. And partly our ignorance in the financial literacy is a reason. So there's a world, uh, if you go to the net and type, world financial literacy map, Right, you can see different countries and different. We are, of course, uh, you know, literacy level is we are high. We are in nineties, literacy level. But financial literacy level, we are in the map. If you look at the world map of financial literacy, we are not in a very high position. We are in a very low level. Whereas countries like Europe, Japan, and so on, we are in the high end of uh, financial literacy, and therefore the countries are doing that. So having said that, I will say thank you to you. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, my discussion uh, this evening made some uh, valuable information to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vijay Bhala, for that very informative session, sir. Your insights have truly added depth to our participants' understanding of energy storage integration. As we move forward, 
we'd like to open the floor for our q and a session we invite you to raise any questions or doubts you may have about the content that was discussed today i encourage all the participants to make the maximum out of this opportunity and ask questions and clarify doubts i would like to mention that you know this is an emerging technology so there are questions if anybody else is having a, a more informative answer anybody can answer any question i will also try to answer my best but anybody else having a better view can also uh, come forward and uh, in uh, you know that enlighten all of us uh, by adding more information into the same subject okay go ahead can I ask questions or you can type into the chat if you want maybe not much of questions but uh, how many of you are having uh, electric vehicles you can say chat you can put a yes mark or something out of 42 of you how many of you are having rooftops or evs i encourage you to think about now uh, of course the this only the second hand market now available and still it is uh, the car prices are quite low so even if you fix a new battery into them so it still make financial sense buy your old nissan leaf and uh, think of putting a battery and then can use it for 5 years or 10 years excuse me good evening sir good evening yes yeah am i audible yes of course yeah firstly thank you sir for this uh, valuable session it was really a uh, great learning for me i'm from india currently i'm pursuing my bachelor of engineering in electrical and electronics engineering yeah sir okay. my question yeah my question uh, for you means uh, as you mentioned regarding the economics of uh, renewable energy means uh, when it comes to means i have been working in one of the project in college basically uh, what we are thinking to do means uh, using our uh, renewable energy we have a huge plant means overhead uh, solar so what we are okay. thinking to do means uh, using that renewable energy we are thinking to uh, build an ecosystem for electric vehicles two wheelers so okay. yeah through that uh, we are planning to do means uh, what is your suggestions regarding that yeah that's an excellent idea but you know the since the renewable energy is not available uh, during the entire period maybe if you are grid price is acceptable you can use the grid in conjunction with the renewable energy yes, because the most of the charging may be in a university conditions maybe during the day time yes, uh, and uh, of course now like what i am doing now now we are deciding we are working with the research project is nit raukela you know Uh, yes, NIT Raukela and the research team from them and uh, we at University of Morocco, Sri Lanka, we are jo jo doing a joint research work where we want to have a self-standing car charger powered by solar rooftop. Solar rooftop and wind if available and provide certain kind of, you know, that uh, we can predetermine what will be the demand of the charging. Okay. we can predetermine what will be the demand curve for charging estimating number of vehicles coming and timing and so on and then we will decide the design the solar pv and the wind system uh, with a fast charger uh, so that it will be using mostly the renewable energy if the grid is available in that location it can be connected to the grid like your case you have the grid so you can use the grid as well but we are designing it without even without grid how to run so we have a battery storage so when we have the solar and wind we will generate and store and then use that for uh, charge 
So in your case, you are better because you have the solar system and the grid, a pretty big solar system. Uh, that will be more economical. Yes, sir. Yeah, that okay. will be more economical. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. Uh, when it comes to fast charging, uh, people need to pay more uh, charges compared to normal charging. So Yes, of course. Yes, yeah. Very high charges, yes. Yeah, sir. And uh, one more question can I ask if you are... Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, sir. Basically, uh, when it comes to uh, EV, I uh, mean, once anybody puts charge their vehicle, I mean, so we will be means it will be generating harmonics, right, sir? It will affecting the grid means the network distribution network harmonics. Yes. Like this, yeah, okay. uh, I mean, yeah, like this in any particular area, if uh, twenty to thirty members will be charging their vehicle, so that all the thirty members harmonics will be uh, putting up to the grid only means the network distribution network. Yes. Okay. And the one more thing is, uh, when it comes to that, means in our uh, India, we had a regulation, right, uh, in Karnataka. Basically, what is the thing is, when we have a peak time, they could not able to charge their vehicle uh, on that peak time. It's an inbuilt system. So uh, what's the problem is, so uh, means on a peak time, they could not able to charge their vehicle. So what we thought to do means uh, shifting that uh, peak load. Like example, when they came to the college, they can charge their vehicle. Like that, uh, we are planning to do means... What are uh, your thoughts are regarding this? Yeah, I think you must think about now, since you have a pretty large solar system, maybe even a new system, you can think of maybe with a small storage battery to stabilize it, you know, have a, for a charger, experiment with one charger, right, which is not connected to the grid, Okay. usually, okay. right? So you have the solar generation plus a small battery just to stabilize the network. Right, because the solar will be intermittent, solar will be coming up and down. So address that intermittency only, you will need a battery. Yes. And by the daytime, you will have a good supply of battery. So so that can alone charge the battery with the inverter. So you are not connected to the grid usually. Yeah. Maybe the connectivity is there. Yes. Right. So during the daytime, then you can straight away charge with the solar PV generation plus your small battery storage. Yes, Without the grid, then this uh, harmonic issue we, going into the network will not be there. Yeah. Yes. So you can do an experiment on that. Sure, sir. I'll build one charger on that basis. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. So there are two more questions which have been sent on the chat. Yeah, I will see. Uh, if someone is, uh, DeSilva is asking if someone is going to by an EV, which CB tariff rate should be taken for domestic charging? Uh, domestic charging is, you know, that now at the moment we have the flat tariff. Flat tariff means we don't have time of day tariff for domestic. Although it is available, it is too expensive. So I think very little number of uh, domestic consumers have on time of day. So when you are, uh, so even if you use the highest block tariff, I think if I go to that tariff sheet. You can see for the domestic people right now, uh, you can see highest tariff is uh, 65 units per kilowatt hour. You can see here, right now it can go up and down. But you can see now if you run 60, even if you are in the six, the highest block, if you pay 65 rupees per kilowatt hour, still you can run six kilometers. So your cost of a kilometer will be about say 11 rupees. Right? Whereas you can't do at that rate for fuel. Right? So therefore, even if you use highest block tariff of CEB today, still it is make still it makes sense rather than using petrol. Right? So even if you become 80 rupees, even it is 80 rupees, right? It will be about 13 rupees per kilo kilometer for energy cost. And also very little maintenance. You don't have oil services and so on. So overall, it will be beneficial, even if you buy the highest domestic rate for charging. And also, Uh, I don't see other questions. Are there any other questions?
uh, okay, I can say, uh, are we achieving uh, the expected amount of efficiency from the solar panel because our panel, PV panels are static towards one particular direction from its initial place. Yes, that's why I said the plant factor is lesser, 12%. Whereas if you have it uh, in a orderly manner in a ground mounted, it is about 16, 17%. So you lose about three to four uh, percent of energy generation because our roofs are not properly facing the view south, and also there may be shades and other things also uh, when it is on roofs. So overall, it is about four to five percent energy is lost on roofs, All right? But you know, if you consider the advantage of roof crops as a country is, I told you that we have about 1,000 megawatts that there. Yeah? They are distributed in nature. Therefore, it, intermittency is not a big issue for the grid operator because when the when the clouds come, clouds will cover only portion number of them, portion of them. And as the cloud moves from some area to other, they will cover the next set of solar PV panels, the roof crops and leaving behind the other ones to be exposed to sun again. Therefore, uh, when you have 1000 megawatts, say in 10 power plants of 100 megawatts, they are concentrated. When a cloud comes, you might lose 100 megawatts. But when you have rooftops uh, spread throughout the country, even if clouds comes, only a portion of they will be covered. Therefore, the intermittency issue will not be uh, very acute for the grid operator. So there are pluses and minuses. And also another advantage of rooftops is you don't have a land cost, right? If you have a ground mounted power plant, you need to have a land for that, right? But uh, because land is valuable, we can use land for other purposes. And the roof is not used for anything else. So roof is just wasted. Therefore, if you use a uh, roof for the rooftops, that four or five percent of energy loss is still as a country is, you know, that uh, compensated by uh, not requiring a land on one hand. On the other hand, intermittency issue is less, uh, you know, grave in the case of rooftops. Uh, how to pump the power from the different sources simultaneously in mind? We can see it is not an issue. So the, the main controller will control it. But of course, uh, they will have each, each, each uh, source maybe solar panel, maybe the wind, they will be connected to the uh, main uh, grid by through an inverter. So the inverter function and uh, the load managing all will be done by the central controller and then that will uh, manage the energy. So if there's any excess, that will be pumped back into the network or put it put into the battery. And uh, how complex can it be for the CEB to manage and synchronize multiple rooftop solar plants to the grid if so many people start using them? You know that there's no synchronizing as such because the solar panels, the inverters work if the grid is available. If the grid is not available, these uh, grid tie inverters, what we call grid tie inverters, will stop working. Right? So... Uh, so that it will not. But the problem with solar uh, is when you have excess generation in one feeder, uh, voltage levels will rise. So especially during domestic feeders, uh, during daytime especially, consumption is very low. And therefore, uh, there will be reverse power flow from the source side through the uh, distribution transformer into the transmission network for the, the third 3 kV network. And meanwhile, because of the excess generation, voltage levels can rise because our voltage is guaranteed to be 230 plus or minus 6%. So, so it will go above that. And then there's a natural feature in the inverters. In, if the voltage is rising beyond that in the feeder, inverters should trip. Tripping settings are there. So if the inverter trips during that period, maybe solar... Uh, generation could happen, but they can't sell. So they can't sell to the network because the uh, inverter has tripped. And therefore, such cases are there. And so these are the issues of solar PV. So the solar PV rooftops have a couple of issues. One is that uh, if you have connected too much, too many installations, 
uh, into the same feeder, then the voltage levels can rise during the peak generation on one on the, on one hand, and uh, on the other hand, you know that uh, uh, harmonic levels can increase, right? Harmonic levels can increase. And of course, uh, there are CB limits. THT has to be less than 5% and so on. But still, harmonic content can be a uh, nuisance in some cases when you have too many solar installations. But I think we must find solutions. We must find solutions, right? One solution is to put uh, uh, in the domestic feeders also to have some battery storage to put the excess energy uh, when you are generating excess energy rather than tripping the inverter if you can save electricity into a battery so that problem can be resolved <laughs> seems like that's all the questions that we've got for today However, if any more questions do arise, please reach out to the Y2N Pro team and we will do our best to get the questions yeah, yeah, answered. Yeah. If I have one more question, I test the central control unit work, workable to operate many years. So all the synchronizing other modes have a manual mode also in our system. So we can uh, all, always, most of the operations, we can switch to manual mode uh, if necessary. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Moving on, we would like to take a moment to express our gratitude to our esteemed speaker, Professor Anura Vijayapala, for accepting our invitation and sharing his valuable knowledge and expertise with us. Please accept our token of appreciation. Your presence here has set a high standard for the caliber of learning we can expect from this workshop series. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Before proceeding, let's take a group photo to remember this valuable time we spent together learning today. I kindly request the audience and OC members to switch on your cameras to take a group photo. Come on, guys, let's switch on your cameras. Okay, everyone, get ready. On the count of three, I'll give you a cue to smile and pose. One, two, three, say cheese. Okay, let's make sure we got a good shot. Are we good to go, Sano? It's okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Also, please note that the quiz will be conducted on 5th of October at the end of the workshop series. We have now shared a feedback form in the Zoom chat. Also, you can scan the QR code on the screen to access the feedback form. We kindly request you to take a few minutes to fill it up. Your feedback is extremely important to us as it helps us to continuously improve and provide you with better experiences in the future. This will also be considered for your attendance. Moving on, the next session will be held on the 7th of September from 6 p.m. onwards, where Professor Gian Battista Grosso, Associate Professor at Politecnicio di Milano, will join us to take you through electric vehicle charging infrastructures. As we near the end of the session, we sincerely hope you found the workshop informative and thought-provoking and that you leave with new insights and ideas. And with that, we conclude today's workshop. Thank you once again and have a good night. <laughs>